The series consists of four events which are scheduled to play, take, have been scheduled to take place during 2022, exploring the dynamics of global city cooperation today. The, the events initially focused on three European capitals, London, Paris and Berlin. <coughs> Excuse me. However, the program expanded its geographical scope to cities and locations in Europe and beyond. The Cities series programme consists of web discussions involving leading experts from partner cities, diplomacy and higher education institutions. And as you can see, the events are hosted online and are open to the public. So this is our opportunity to hear as many views and positions as possible, with perhaps a view to mapping out an agenda for future development. Knowledge diplomacy, and that is our focus today, no Knowledge diplomacy is a contested term, one that our project seeks to evaluate with a, with a greater scrutiny than it's been given in the past, hopefully to provide for enhanced understanding. And the, the team that has been organizing this proposed a conceptual definition, which sees knowledge diplomacy as an orchestra of collaborative, representative and negotiation processes, aiming to establish consensual knowledge on various issues. And this will include formal and or informal understanding between policymakers and experts in particular fields, academics and practitioners, on how to resolve national or global problems. And at a time when we are, if you like, all too aware that we live in a time of global conflict, we hope that this event will emphasize that the present panel discussion can be seen as a contribution in the search for solutions to present crises. I am delighted that we have today a very distinguished panel, and I would like to, in, to introduce them to you. I'm Mary Stiasny from the University of London. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor International Learning and Teaching at the University of London, and my job is to chair this event. But our speakers, as I say, our distinguished speakers, are Jeremy Lachal, who is the Executive Director of Libraries Without Borders, and he has also been appointed as an Ashoka Fellow in 2015, where his lifelong fellowship forms part of a network of approximately 4,000 fellows in over 90 countries committed to championing new patterns of social good. Jeremy has also worked with the French National Assembly as a parliamentary attaché. He also has worked with Doctors Without Borders. Our second speaker is Sir Bergen, former head of the Council of Europe's Education Department, and Sia has worked with the Council of Europe in a number of leading positions, specifically as the head of education department, head of higher education and history teaching, and head of higher education division. Prior to his posts with the Council of Europe, Sia worked with the University of Oslo. He specializes in the following areas, higher education policy, in particular qualifications and qualification frameworks, roles and purposes of higher education, and public responsibility for higher education. Then our third speaker is John Douglas, who is the Senior Research Fellow and Research Professor for Public Policy and Higher Education at the Center for Studies in Higher Education at the University of California of Berkeley. John has been a visiting professor at the Berlin Social Science Research Center, Amsterdam University College, the Universidad de Estuad de, de Campinas, Brazil, Sciences Po, Paris, and at the Oxford Center for Higher Education Policy Studies. He founded and leads the student experience in the Research University Consortium, and he's an editor of the Center's Research and Occasional Paper Series, as well as sitting on the editorial board of a number of international higher education journals in Europe, China, and Russia. And then our fourth speaker is Mina Pham, who is the Councillor for Science and Technology at the French Embassy in the UK. Before starting her post with the French Embassy in 2015, she was the director of the INRA Lab, Lab of Comparative Neurobiology Biology of Invertebrates. She was then appointed as the Councillor for Science and Technology at the French Embassy in Washington, DC for five years. In France, she was elected as the Vice President of International Relations at University Paris Sciences et Lettres and worked for the selection, selection of, P, of a PSL as an excellence university. Finally, Min, Mino is uh, 
a, a member of the board of the Global Council of Science and the Environment in the United States. So I'm going to invite each of our speakers to speak, each in turn, and then we will have an opportunity for questions. We're asking you to save your questions, put them in the chat in, in due course. Um, so I think really, without any further ado, what I'd like to do is invite Jeremy to start. So Jeremy Lachal, Executive Director of Libraries Without Borders. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Mary, and thank you very much for your invitation. I'm going to, to, to share my screen. Uh, can you see my, uh, my presentation? Yeah, it's working. Uh, first of all, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be uh, with you today. Thank you very much for, 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 for the, the invitation. I have to admit that I don't belong there directly to the higher education sphere. So it's a little bit, uh, you know, a, 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 a sidestep that I, uh, I propose you to do with me today. Uh, I'm the executive director and co-founder of, uh, of Libraries for Borders. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about the organization and I, I will focus more specifically on uh, on our program our current program for ukrainian refugees uh, and i will end by giving you some insight on on how we do leverage um, higher education partnerships to to increase our impact um, maybe to tell you a, a, a word on libraries for border the organization has been founded by uh, the historian patrick veil uh, 15 years ago uh, and we work to empower our community worldwide by improving access to education and information. We, what we try to do with, uh, with Libraries for Borders is to uh, get uh, uh, the, the, the right information at the right moment for people uh, in vulnerable conditions. And these people include people in crisis or people uh, in refugee camps or, uh, or people in very precarious uh, environments. We work in around 30 countries uh, with uh, around 130 staff around the world. Uh, and uh, and we are starting now like a big plan to uh, increase uh, the, the the reach and the impact uh, 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 that we want to have in the the next ten years. But I think this is another story. Uh, maybe uh, just to give you a little bit more insight about how we work. Basically, what we do is always working through uh, partners on the field, which, which can be uh, 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 like uh, public uh, public institutions like local uh, local authorities or states, but also NGOs, local uh, local actors from the civil societies and basically we bring them three types of uh, of resources we bring them tools to outreach and get access bring access to knowledge where people actually are and i will give you some uh, some uh, some see on on, our, on this kind of tools we work uh, on curation and creation of contents uh, in more than 25 languages uh, today uh, to to get the good content at the, to the good people at the good time and we work on uh, mediation and training uh, specifically designed for uh, these local actors on the field. And this brings us to work in very, very various environment from uh, Rohingya uh, refugee camps uh, in Bangladesh to uh, uh, poor communities in France or in the Bronx in New York, but also, of course, uh, to people in crisis, uh, uh, as we are going to see it in uh, uh, for the Ukrainian environment. We work around these five big thematics, which I think and we think at Libraries for Borders are some of the, the big questions of for today's society about, uh, uh, you know, like I think 50 years ago, if you didn't know how to read, it was like a big, uh, a, a big um, uh, barriers uh, to, to, to enter and to participate to, to societies. Today, if you don't know how to, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, use the computers or use the internet, uh, you have this kind of uh, the same, uh, uh, the same problematic. And we do have specific programs for two kinds of po populations, uh, refugees and people uh, in humanitarian crisis. So you have like a big, like a kind of overview of the, the, the where we walk around the world. Uh, maybe, maybe before, uh, uh, just before getting into the, 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 the response for Ukrainian, I, I want to, to give you a, 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 a kind of big idea of general idea of how we do approach the question of uh, people in crisis. Uh, we do work around two big thematics at Libraries for Borders. The, the first one is this question of information security. 
information security is like a, like a concept that we created from the idea of uh, food security that is quite uh, uh, used in a humanitarian uh, context. Um, actually, when you look at the 50% of the world population that don't have access to the internet, or if you more specifically look uh, to specific population in crisis, for example, refugees in transit or people fleeing a countries uh, struck, uh, struck by, uh, by a war, for example, uh, this, this population are in big insecurity regarding information, information, access to information, just having access to an internet connection to get uh, uh, access to the good information but also accessibility and use of the information and the risk of getting uh, fake news or uh, the risk of uh, not having the good digital literacy for example to have the to to to, to be able to 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 get the good information at the good time for example um, at the ukrainian border we uh, we, we met with lots of people who had no idea to where to go in Europe and were just like, uh, you know, hearing a call to go to Bordeaux, for example, in France, and they are just like jumping into the bus without knowing where they were going to. So th there is this big question about uh, information, which is central in this kind of uh, crisis. Here you have like a picture of, uh, uh, of a refugee camps, uh, of the Kutupalong refugee camps in Bangladesh, um, where there was like big issues about this question of uh, uh, um, communication with communities and how we, we, we bring the good information to, to population. The second big concept around which we work at Libraries for Borders is how we create learning societies. Not only like people learning at schools, but learning all, uh, all their life. Uh, uh, and uh, it's true when you take like a society like France or, or developed society, of course, about uh, how do we train people uh, to be able to learn all their life and to be able to, to be more resilient toward you know, the big change. But it's even more important uh, in crisis and post-crisis situation. Here on this picture, you have, uh, um, you have a view of our program in Colombia uh, after the peace treaty with the FARC uh, in 2017, where we, where we deployed uh, libraries for peace with the, 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 the government. And uh, um, in these libraries, there was like this, uh, uh, local populations meeting with the former FARC combatants and creating together the way they were uh, going to yeah, create this, uh, this future and this common future. And the fact that was incredible to me, and I think for many people who are visiting our libraries, that uh, in this library, one, one of the workshops that was the most used by uh, the FARC combatant was the digital workshop. They were learning how to use computers because in the jungle, they had like no access to this kind of tools. And, uh, you know, it was like a, a meet, the meeting of like two very different worlds. Uh, 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 in this uh, in, in these libraries. So how do we do that? In 2014, we created the Ideas Box, which is a one-stop shop for access to information for the most challenging circumstances. So it's it's been designed by the, the designer Philip Stark, and it's a very portable multimedia center. So that fits on these two palettes, as you see it. And when you open it, you have this module, these four modules that create a, a, a 100 meter square safe space that give access to internet connections, tablets, computer, ebooks, digital education content, and even a cinema uh, to, 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 to get access to videos and this kind of thing. And all, um, all of this is uh, uh, equipped with the, the furniture, with the tables, with the chairs, and there is an, uh, a generator inside. So the box covers its own power needs. Each box is uh, the same. We have like more than 130 uh, ideas box around the world today. Each box is the same in terms of shape, but each box is different in terms of content and programming and activities. You have some example here. You have on the right corner, these pictures in Colombia where the ideas box came at the, like the very uh, uh, middle in the jungle. You have here at the border, the French border at, uh, at Calais. It's not exactly the border, but uh, where there was this refugee uh, 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 people in transit to, to UK. You have some example in Burundi for, uh, for refugees, uh, Congolese refugees uh, at the, um, and here in Iraq, uh, in Iraq for, for Syrian refugees. And when it comes to uh, deploying ideas box in post-war context or refugee camps, 
we do reach each time this concept, this, uh, these objectives of psychosocial support, peace building, continuing education, women and girls empowerment, which are like recurring uh, kind of uh, objectives and, uh, uh, and thematics that we, 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 we try to, 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 to reach. Um, this is uh, like just a very quick slide on other tools that we deploy, uh, because as I was saying, 50% of the world population does not have access to quality internet. So when there is no internet, we deploy this kind of uh, server that creates Wi-Fi, local Wi-Fi access point that only people to get access to the content which is on the server. That can be very important in, in, in contexts where there is no internet at all. And we do have like this uh, very new project which called Kaju, which are SD card that you put into your smartphone. Uh, so we deploy that a lot in Africa, for example, in very uh, remote areas, but it can be very useful as well for refugees that want to get access to um, secured, verified, and without any uh, use of data. Uh, content, which you just put the SD card into your smartphone and you have all access uh, uh, offline. To tell you a, a bit of, about uh, our work in Ukraine, uh, you, I think you, I, I learned, actually I learned this figure which is used by UNICEF like last week and I thought, wow, this is very, very striking. One child per second has fled Ukraine and become a refugee since February 24th. I'm, I'm sure maybe this, uh, this figure is a little, a little bit now uh, outdated, but uh, Anyway, you, 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 the, 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 I, I use this figure just to remind you how this crisis is specific, because most of the time when it comes to refugees, uh, we, um, you know, there was like this recurring story. I don't know how it, uh, it is in your countries, but in France, we always talk about, we always hear about refugees, about uh, there are young men on, alone. And in this specific case, uh, it's mostly uh, women and children that uh, has uh, crossed the border and the, the, the men uh, has uh, remained in Ukraine to fight. Uh, so uh, the first move of, uh, of libraries for, without borders was to deploy 10 ideas box for refugee information, protection, and psychosocial support at the border of Poland, Moldova, and Romania. And basically these ideas box have three big purposes. First, creating safe space for children when they can just be children again. Uh, and this is very important because uh, uh, you know that uh, in this kind of very traumatic context, um, giving just this kind of, uh, of bubble outside uh, the, the chaotic reality is very important for children just to, to breathe and to, um, uh, and, and, and to relax a little bit. Um, uh, reliable and secure information for adults. And this was also something very, very important just to give the mother the possibility to leave their children during one hour or two hours, two hours just to have their time for themselves as well. And the possibility to get access to psychosocial support for, for refugees of all, all ages. And the fact that to, to provide secure information has been very, very important in particular in the very uh, early days of the uh, of the crisis, where there were lots of predation at the borders, lots of people coming from all over the world just to, you know, approach uh, women alone, children, and kidnap them, etc. There are like tons of people who disappeared. Uh, so there, there was like a big need of information, not only to give information about the destination, but also to like for protections. We also install emergency libraries in refugee shelters in France, in Belgium, and in Italy. And this idea of creating this kind of space, safe space, but in the, uh, I would say, like the welcoming point. And we are on the edge of launching a mobile app for, 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 for learning French language. But I, 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 don't, uh, I don't stop too long on that. Here are some uh, pictures of, of, of the first deployment at the border, which were like in, uh, in gymnasium at uh, Rubiesov at the board, uh, sorry, at the, at the very border. And you see like people were like in the, in the gymnasium spending, you know, two hours from two hours to two days, basically, before, before leaving and taking this bus getting over to Europe uh, or in other places to Europe. And we are really uh, in, the, in the corner of the gymnasium with the uh, ideas box uh, set up, quite a tiny setup, but it was uh, very interesting to have this uh, specific, uh, uh, you know, safe space for the children. Uh, and uh, we had like uh, lots of, um, uh, moms uh, with these children, just like uh, leaving them, and we we could have like separate discussion with them and take a social with the woman uh, to uh, during the there were like some some people taking care of the children. 
I'm just finishing with uh, uh, how we use higher education because I I, I know that uh, uh, our specific work to Ukraine uh, uh, for for Ukraine uh, and this is uh, is quite. I would say like far from uh, 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 the academic work, uh, but um, maybe more broadly at libraries for borders, uh, uh, each time we work with this kind of population, we try to connect with uh, higher education institutions for two kinds of things. First for increasing our impact, then to build uh, more knowledge. In terms of increasing our impact, uh, we provide access to higher education opportunities to refugee students. We did that pilot with Coursera for refugees in Congolese refugee camps in Burundi. Two promotion of 50 students uh, has been taking Coursera classes uh, and received certificates from top universities around the world. This is one example, and we are working on scaling up in uh, uh, other refugee camps we work in. We also use um, our offline internet strategy to strengthen outreach and quality of university services as we do, for example, in Senegal. This is not like a, a, a conflict uh, situation or a refugee uh, context, but uh, uh, we do use this SD Kaju SD cards to reach 6,000 students in all over the countries with offline um, campus, uh, offline version of the MOOC. Uh, so they don't have uh, to, uh, any need of, uh, of data to, 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 to learn and to, 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 to review their courses. And then we uh, work, for example, with a university, uh, this example of uh, the, the work with University of Bujumbura, which is a, a, a sense of uh, working on agency and peace, peace building process with students of all the regions. And we deploy this kind of uh, library for peace and this idea of uh, how do we empower people more to build more resilient and, uh, and, and peaceful societies. And uh, on the research part and how we build knowledge, uh, we do lots of impact evaluation with research body and we work uh, specifically today with uh, GPL in Europe uh, on uh, programs for uh, big, big uh, randomized evaluation in, in Senegal. Uh, and we do also have research and actions. And we, uh, I, I mentioned the programs we have on the French uh, learning app for refugees. And we have a partnership with Université Côte d'Azur on the analysis of learning data on the French learning app. Uh, so analysis of pedagogical efficiency, identification of systematic errors, etc. So th this is a very big, like, very quick overview of our work with, uh, with higher education but uh, for, for, for us, you know, higher education bodies are always uh, a good partners to make more and to, to, to reach more people, make more impact, etc. But and it's also a good source of, uh, of knowledge and support to, uh, to, 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 to build a better action, I would say. Uh, I will leave you on that because I know that there are plenty of questions around uh, uh, to, to, to follow. So thank you very much for, for your attention and uh, happy to, uh, to, to discuss it further. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And now I'm going to move us on. Um, oh, there is a message in the chat for you. If you want to learn more about the work that library Libraries Without Borders done it, does in response to the conflict, there is a video that you can watch yourselves after the webinar. So please do, do have a look at that. So thank you, Jeremy. And now I'd like to introduce Sjur Bergen, who is, as I said before, the former head of the Council of Europe's Education Department. So over to you now, Sjur. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. And um, it's an honor to be here. As you said, I, I'm now retired from the Council of Europe, so I can no longer pretend to speak on behalf of the Council of Europe. I will nevertheless speak, obviously, um, from the background of someone who's worked with an intergovernmental organization for quite some time. And that perhaps uh, also um, dictates uh, part of the approach. And it would be even better if we could actually move the slides. Yeah, here we go. So uh, my starting point, as, as our chair said, um, knowledge diplomacy is perhaps a controversial, I might even say a bit of a fussy, um, concept. My starting point is um, two points made by Jane Knight, who is a Canadian scholar at the International Organization of Higher Education, who wrote a report on knowledge diplomacy in action actually for the British Council. And as you will see from this definition, uh, she emphasizes obviously um, the international aspects, but um, she includes higher education, research, and innovation. 
Um, you could probably also make a, a point saying that it's not just higher education, more probably it could even be education. Um, and she says it serves building and strengthening relations between and among countries, and it's also characterized by collaborative knowledge production that uh, might be uh, useful. So it's a fairly broad uh, concept. Uh, and um, if you sort of try to distill it very briefly, um, it is a broader concept than two very commonly used terms, soft power, which I believe was introduced by Joseph Nye in the early 2000s. Um, uh, and also it's it includes, but it's far more than um, what we very often try to stimulate, namely academic exchange. Um, it's also uh, more than cultural diplomacy. Culture is a part of it. We try it through knowledge diplomacy also to develop an understanding of each other's cultures, but it does uh, have a research part, innovation part, um, a part of intellectual development. Intellectual development, of course, is, is important in education at, at any stage. And unlike, uh, at least as what Jane Knight says, unlike science diplomacy, um, knowledge diplomacy encompasses all academic disciplines, uh, not just the hard sciences, uh, mathematics, uh, physics, uh, etc. Um, one big question, I think, has not been raised by Jane Knight, but um, it is obviously increasingly important, both, uh, if you think about cooperation with China, but also in the with, with a number of other countries and um, now in the Ukraine uh, war, is where does the fundamental values come into the picture? Do we pursue knowledge diplomacy regardless of values, or do we pursue uh, knowledge diplomacy in search of certain fundamental values. Um, in the European higher education area, there is a clear um, definition of what the fundamental values of higher education and uh, are. Um, they're um, academic freedom, academic integrity, um, institutional autonomy. Um, they're also student and staff participation in the governance of higher education. And they are uh, public responsibility for, but also of higher education. So I think one interesting question for the discussion is um, how do we then deal with systems or um, institutions that may not be characterized by a, a great commitment to one or more of the fundamental values. That certainly is, is, is an issue, for example, uh, for China. Um, I mentioned China specifically because many European countries, and I think also in North America are now, uh, or at least have been, very um, eager to establish closer cooperation with China, and you can all certainly see rationale behind it. Now, this, uh, I think, also builds on a number of underlying assumptions. Um, first of all, it, it does build on the assumption that increasing <coughs> knowledge and build, uh, broadening access to knowledge is desirable. So uh, in a sense, um, knowledge is uh, seen as a public good. In fact, in the European higher education area, ministers um, in the early 2000s said that higher education is a public good and a public responsibility. In my view, that would be, um, that's probably not an entire public good and it's certainly not an entire private good. And the really operational part of the statement is to see where the public responsibility for higher education actually uh, lies. Um, so we, we certainly also see um, a strong emphasis then on cooperation. And that is partly, of course, because higher education research are eminently international uh, domains. The universities, as we know them today, is really an international phenomenon. Uh, the first universities in Italy, uh, in um, France, and the UK, um, were certainly place-based, but they also had a very international student body. In fact, I, I think at that time, the um, students will certainly have faced greater difficulty in traveling and from a practical point of view, but they also faced uh, fewer restrictions on visas, on uh, border crossings, etc. So um, 
and of course with the common language of the, which at the time was, was Latin. So higher education does have a very strong international uh, um, ethos to it. There have been um, some attempts saying that national uh, science is national, and of course you have the infamous attempt um, in Nazi Germany at a, establishing Aryan physics. It was not a great success. Um, to put it mildly, um, and it really it underscored that um, science, that uh, academic research and higher education is international in nature. And that, of course, raises some important questions because we are now in an unprecedented situation in Europe, at least. Um, the war on Ukraine, and there's no other way to to, to characterize it. Um, it's not just a crisis, it's not just a minor thing. It is a full-scale invasion by Russia of Ukraine. And I think any calling it by any other name is, is really diminishing its importance. It is a watershed. Um, Europe has not quite seen anything like this um, for a very long time. Um, certainly um, not in my generation's memory. And, um, you could argue that uh, this hasn't happened since World War II. You have the invasion of Hungary in 56 um, and the Czechoslovakia in 68. You, of course, have um, also uh, other armed conflicts, but this is really an all out invasion of a country by another country. So it has led to very strong reactions in most European countries. And one of those reactions um, is a very healthy one, um, which is to say, we need to help Ukraine. U Ukraine cannot face this alone. So the Ukrainian part of knowledge diplomacy, if you want this, is very much to say in the short term, we need to receive Ukrainian refugees. Those, so those refugees who have a higher education background, whether that's a staff or a students, need to be able to uh, continue their work to continue their studies um, and uh, countries are showing great flexibility to allow that to happen. Um, from the Council of Europe side, we have developed um, and developed around 2016-17 on the basis of the Syrian refugee crisis, a European qualifications passport for refugees that aims to provide a methodology for assessing refugees' qualifications, even when these cannot be fully documented, and then also uh, a method to describe the, the, the qualifications so that um, if and when refugees move across the border, um, they don't have to undergo the assessment again. Um, I think one characteristic now is that, um, as Jaime also pointed out, the border line, the bordering countries, uh, Poland in particular, but also a number of other countries are really the countries that have received the highest number of refugees. Uh, Poland, in absolute terms, I think it's there is a very recent underlying also the excellent work done by Moldova, which in um, relative terms has probably received almost as many refugees as Poland. And it's also it might be worth um, underlining that some of these countries, Poland as an example, was quite reluctant to receive refugees uh, from the Middle East in the wake of the uh, Syrian crisis, whereas now um, they've been very uh, good in receiving refugees from Ukraine. That's, of course, the short term. The longer term challenge is a different one. There is massive destruction of uh, higher education installations, institutions, buildings, etc. at least in parts of Ukraine, in the east, eastern and southeastern. The Ukraine will need um, massive assistance in rebuilding. Um, but there is also a longer term challenge, and that is you need to rebuild higher education in Ukraine without accelerating brain drain. Ukraine is, is very clear and underlining that um, Ukrainians now have to flee, but they also need to come back. And, and um, most, my impression is that most of those who flee Ukraine now are very intent on coming back when conditions make that possible. That may take a couple of years. 
uh, but it, it is an important. That might also mean that um, we need to calibrate our assistance, not just to say that we have to assist Ukrainians who make it abroad. We may also have to think more innovatively in, for example, making it possible to second teachers, um, academic staff from various uh, European universities for longer or, or shorter period to go to uh, higher education institutions in Ukraine and teach there so that the teachers move and not necessarily students. Ukraine is also a country that is quite advanced in online teaching and learning, and they are establishing what they call a Ukrainian global university that um, is largely online. The other side of the coin here, of course, how do we deal with Russia? Russia is the aggressor. Um, I think there is, um, and that is also saying, we would like to help those Russian academics who take a clear position against the war. And they do exist. Um, there are Russian academics who have uh, taken a very clear stand against the war at great personal risks, especially in the early parts of the war. But there is also a statement by the Russian Rector's Conference from early March, um, where they express strong support for the war and even say outright that um, <clears throat> the main task of universities is to support the state and to promote patriotism. So how do you square that? And in between these two groups, there is, of course, a large silent majority who don't take a specific stand on, on the war. Um, I think most would agree that we need to cut cooperation with um, official Russia and try to help those who speak up against the war. It is very difficult to see now how that could actually be done. And um, being in touch with foreign institutions, which can be seen as foreign agents, quote unquote, according to Russian legislation, might also put Russian academics at risk. Um, so we do see that many countries, institutions, as well as the European Union have cut um, higher education cooperation. And in the European higher education area, we also took the painful step of suspending the rights of participation of Russia and Belarus. Now, the final question then is, um, how do we deal from an international organization's point of view with this. Uh, we may here need to distinguish um, between different kinds of international organizations. On the one hand, between intergovernmental organizations and NGOs, for example, university organizations. And we may need to distinguish also between global organizations and European organizations. The United Nations, for example, has a very, very high threshold for excluding any members, and uh, that is very understandable. The Council of Europe actually took the step of excluding Russia as a member already in early March because of the invasion of Ukraine. Um, I think another couple of elements from our work can illustrate some of the discussions. So it was very clear that Russia uh, needed to be excluded from overall intergovernmental cooperation. At the other extreme, we have a joint convention with UNESCO called the Lisbon Recognition Convention, the purpose of which is to facilitate the recognition of foreign qualifications. Russia and Belarus are parties to it. The convention benefits individuals. So I would personally um, argue strongly that we should not exclude Russia and Belarus from this convention because it helps individuals rather than the state. And then in the middle, you have something called the European Cultural Convention, which is our framework for intergovernmental cooperation in education, culture, and others. Now, there are two uh, areas as far as, um, as education is concerned that specifically mentioned, probably because the convention, the cultural convention dates from 1954, uh, and that is language and history education. Now, Russia's justification, quote unquote, for invading Ukraine, is partly based on a falsification of history. And it's also based on denying um, that there is such a thing as the Ukrainian people, and therefore also as the Ukrainian language. Um, for legal reasons, it's, it's very difficult to exclude a country from a convention. Many, most international conventions uh, were not made with an exclusion clause, but we will probably have to look at um, how we can, um, how we can, um, suspend the rights of participation. And that, of course, is the final questions. 
raises the question, which we can discuss on when and how Russia could come back to knowledge diplomacy to international cooperation. In conclusion, I think we need to cooperate broadly, even when conditions are very difficult, but there are occasions when cooperation is impossible, and uh, the war in Ukraine in relation to Russia illustrates that point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joan. And um, again, we will have a chance to ask questions towards the end. So I'd now like to move on and invite John Douglas to speak. Just to remind you that John is the Senior Research Fellow and Research Professor at the Center for Studies in Higher Education at the University of California, Berkeley. So over to you, John. Thank you, sir. Over to you, John. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, that last presentation was, I thought, spot on. Many of the things I was going to discuss, but what I want to uh, open with is to say that, uh, as as Sir has noted and as in the uh, documentation for this uh, event, uh, um, knowledge of diplomacy seems to be a, a great many things, <laughs> and it, uh, you know, I think one way to think more concretely about it is where does it you know, makes sense in certain kinds of variables. Uh, uh, and this is, I think, one of the reasons I was, I think, invited was I recently published a book uh, called Neo-Nationalism in Universities. It was published before the Ukrainian um, <clears throat> crisis, uh, but I'm a big believer in case studies and looking at each, you know, a series of countries that we looked at Russia, I, there was some chapter contributors that were in the book as well. We looked at Russia, China, Hong Kong, uh, Brazil, uh, a, a range, and uh, I outline a kind of a range of political dynamics and what happens to universities within those. So one of the themes in the book is that uh, I, I, I take a political determina ter determination uh, viewpoint, and that being that the political environment the universities operate in are, is as you know significant as any other real significant you know uh, variable people talk about organizational theories theory economic impact uh these different things but the political world in which they operate is really it's significant and the theme of this event is uh, knowledge diplomacy in crisis so i think what i would say is that looking at uh, a series of case studies for example um turkey hong kong hungary russia i'll just say a few things about them is you see a distinct pattern that occurs uh, over time. Uh, the crisis doesn't just event, you know, it's not a single event, it's a long period of, of, uh, of, of, of things that happen. And uh, in illiberal democracies and autocratic regimes, this range uh, that we're, we're seeing now, uh, with Ukraine being a different part of this story, but we'll come back to that, um, you see a conscious effort to take over governance to uh, even after a period of reform, uh, such as in China or Russia, you have a, a, a determined effort by the, the government to take over governance. And that means everything from the boards to the rectors, uh, uh, they have significant influences. There are always uh, you know, exceptions <laughs> uh, or the exceptions start becoming less and less exceptions <laughs> over time. And so just to give you an example in the Russian case, Leading up to the Ukrainian war, uh, we've had a significant uh, uh, turnover of rectors. Uh, there was a period where rectors were, uh, uh, once again, in a European model, uh, elected by the institutions themselves. There was a great variety of institutions, but uh, the, most of the institutions, the, the state uh, and the federal um, uh, institutions and the ones that we know so well, uh, is that you know they would uh, uh, they basically had started to uh, put in other appointees over the last hundred, uh, over the last three years or so, uh, to be you know that were basically being appointed by the Kremlin uh, and and Putin, particularly in the major institutions. Putin's directly involved, and then more recently, uh, leading up against this Ukrainian war, the FSB has been involved in hiring and um, and. Uh, 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 promoting faculty, uh, the FSB being the, uh, you know, the successor to the KGB. Uh, so this is a really alarming process, but you see this in various uh, uh, more right-wing illiberal democracies that what we call them, you know, uh, so you see it in Hungary, you see it in uh, uh, 
uh, in Hong Kong, with Hong Kong becoming really an extension of China in terms of its higher ed policies more and more. There's still some differences, but you see that trend. So what does that mean? Well, in knowledge diplomacy, as Sir noted, there's a range of activities that one can be involved with. Almost all the one examples he gave, which is where we're really at in these more extreme cases, is trying to help and benefit individuals. Um, uh, the uh, academic diaspora that we see. And there's a series of programs and things that are being done. Uh, the G7 just announced uh, uh, a program uh, to uh, facilitate students and uh, faculty from Ukraine, for example, and to support them. Uh, but this is the trend. It's more about individuals than the institutions because many of these institutions are not, you can't really be engaged with them in a productive way. So uh, this is adding, as, uh, as noted before, to this kind of um, brain drain from various parts of the world. If you look at Hong Kong, for example, uh, the exodus is, is not as great as in other parts of the uh, uh, right wing world, but you're seeing that uh, uh, you know Canada, uh, US, and others have offered programs for academics. But the, old, the other thing that's very important to understand this is the scale. The scale of the problem uh, that has really accelerated in the last, uh, you, know, uh, you know, five, four years, uh, depends on how you want to count it, uh, uh, and the amount of uh, programs that are available for individuals, uh, there's a, uh, a significant disjuncture. But you know, uh, it's also very hard for individuals. Uh, you know, Ukraine is having very direct aid, and you're seeing benefits to this, uh, and the scale is significant um, to uh, support refugees. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the DAD just announced that it was going to support 100,000 um, faculty and students. I didn't look what the breakdown is uh, for that. Uh, but uh, for a lot of academics in Turkey, for example, trying to navigate and find a place to go uh, is very difficult. There's so many agencies involved. Um, there's the Academics in Exile, there's Scholars at Risk programs, there's ones that are national, those are NGOs. Uh, you know, so it's really quite significant. And I, you know, I don't know how much the situation in Turkey is on the spectrum of people. Um, but that is a very tragic and significant event. Uh, um, after the uh, um, attempted coup, uh, um, Erdogan has really clamped down on, uh, on those that he feels are potential adversaries. And, and this is another theme that you see is that in autocratic neoliberal democracies, they really do see uh, you know, universities as potential um, hotbeds of sedition, opposition to the to the party. Um, it's not always the case, as I said, because sometimes the leadership is actually playing right along with the autocratic uh, uh, governments. Uh, but in Turkey, for example, um, how do you help Turkish academics? Well, some of them are getting out. Very few, though, because uh, if you were tagged, if you, you uh, uh, signed this, uh, this petition against uh, uh, um, Erdogan at one point early in the in the crisis after the uh, um, after the uh, coup attempt, you're on a blacklist, and that blacklist has resulted in um, over like twenty thousand faculty being and academic staff. We get uh, that terminology, but uh, have been uh, fired, and they've been put into kind of a, their passports are often taken away. They can't get employment. Uh, they're in a kind of a, a a civil death is what uh, uh, one of the observers has called it, in which they can't have mobility to get out. So um, I just wanted to come back to this conceptual idea that you know you have this uh, um, uh, the political the political environment to which the universities operate uh, is so significant as to the level or what kinds of interaction uh, one can really have, you know, in terms of NGOs or, or uh, uh, agencies like, uh, you know, uh, that, that have been funded by the G7 or these kinds of things. So, and, and if I look at the US reaction, for example, as well, um, you know, it's really been underwhelming. Um, there's been an extension of visas for uh, 
Ukrainian students and faculty, for example. Uh, but uh, um, uh, you know, it's a very limited range thus far, as you could probably remember as well. The U.S. is very, you know, not a significant player in providing refugees out of Syria as well. So you see a kind of a, a, a pattern with that. So uh, that's basically what I wanted to say is this range of kind of activities that really can happen. And right now, as I think Sir was kind of noting, is that we're talking about uh, in these crisis situations, uh, and even in Ukraine, which we hope to rebuild and have capacity building, at some point, there's a transitional period uh, that, uh, uh, you know, we're really talking about helping individuals. It's hard to build actual institutional capacity in these environments. So with that, I'm, I'm, that's my last comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to move us on to Mina, Mina Pham, who is the Councillor for Science and Technology at the French Embassy in the UK. So over to you, Mina. I think you're still muted, Mina. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. Um, as John said, a lot have been said by Sur in terms of definitions and, uh, and the um, frame of the, uh, of the uh, discussion. And uh, I would like to add maybe to focus a bit on the uh, science diplomacy among knowledge diplomacy, which is a, of course a border, uh, broader sorry, concept. Uh, in terms of science diplomacy, there is already quite a lot to say. And uh, as a counselor for science and technology, I, I would say a few words about what I know from my uh, position in the um, diplomatic network, the French diplomatic network. Um, science diplomacy for me is uh, what ensure the, ensures the continuity of the dialogue between scientific community and it consists in fostering and facilitating the collaboration between uh, research and university partners in two countries or different countries which are uh, in difficult either when a country is, is in, in, in crisis or when two countries, including the French, uh, the France, well, France, sorry, uh, has, uh, has uh, conflicts with other countries. Um, just a, a few words about our French diplomatic network, because it's quite a specificity for such a rather small country as France. We have the third uh, diplomatic network, which is quite big, a big network with more than 150 uh, diplomatic uh, representation all among the world, which is uh, the third position after United States and China. And you see, of course, the difference in the size sizes of the countries. Uh, in among this network, there are hundred, well, at least tens, even hundreds of uh, science or academic attaches in each of these uh, uh, embassies. And as for the counselor for science and technology, we are now five, only five. There were, there, there, there were more in, in the past, but now we are five in major countries in terms of, of, of science and technology, such as the United States, the uh, United Kingdom, uh, Germany, uh, Russia, and Japan. And of course, there is also a uh, um, deputy counselor in China. Of course, other countries like India, South Africa, which have which are very strong in science, have also uh, attaches with, who plays a major role. Um, now, if we go to uh, what is the the main topic of this uh, of this uh, meeting today, uh, which is about what happens in terms of well, in 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 situation in context of crisis, uh, maybe I have some comments and maybe differences if we consider the uh, research collaboration or the mobility of students. And for me, it's a bit different um, when we consider collaboration among uh, researchers. It's, well, in general, even out of the uh, context of a crisis, it's more, uh, well, it starts with a bottom-up process where people get to know each other and wish, and wish to work together. And um, at the very beginning, it's an interpersonal kind of connections. And then it comes to the institution and sometimes to intergovernmental type of cooperative of agreements. Uh, but 
even when there are crises between countries, the connections, the basic connections between the people, the researchers remains. And most of the time, the scientists succeed in maintaining their cooperation, even though it's at a distance. Now, if we consider the uh, mobility, mobility issues of uh, students mainly, it is another, uh, it, it is different because of course, when there are political uh, conflicts or difficulties, then it becomes much more difficult to have the students uh, moving from one country to the other and studying from, well, um, going to another country. So, of course, this is a different, different issues there that we have to consider separately. Now, in terms of what we are, uh, which is, which is at stake now with the war in Ukraine, as it has been said, there are different positions according to countries. And uh, in our uh, department, we have been conducting surveys and uh, benchmarking about what's happening in the UK and in France. Uh, if we look at the support to Ukraine, the uh, British government has set up a three million pound scheme, which uh, is called um, Researchers at Risk Fellowship Program, and it is administered by the British Academy. And this scheme is dedicated to Ukrainian researchers fleeing the conflict, and it will offer uh, Ukrainian researchers a salary up to two years and will cover research expenses. And um, 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 University UK has implemented a pairing scheme for British and Ukrainian universities, which sets a legal framework and possibilities for Ukrainian professors and researchers to come and work at British in British universities. As for France, the French Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation has set up a hardship fund dedicated to Ukrainian researchers in danger and in exile. The scheme called Solidarité Ukraine is part of a broader scheme, POSE, which is administered by the CNRS for researchers from around the world in exile. For Ukrainian researchers, it offers funding for three months research stays and cover family expenses. Um, it has been said by Sur that um, the position towards Russia can be a bit more uh, uh, ambiguous. Uh, in the UK, as opposed to the European Commission reaction to the um, research, um, um, research collaboration with Russian University, which has been suspended by the European Commission, uh, in the UK, it is recommended to have, well, the, 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 there are arguments against a blanket boycott, and they uh, are more in favor of case-by-case -case decisions on whether or not stopping or, or maintaining the collaboration with Russian universities. So uh, this is what I can say uh, regarding the conflicts with uh, in Ukraine. Now, there are other types of, of crisis. I, I, I'm not sure that this is uh, exactly what you, you focused on, but in my position, my current position in the, uh, in the UK, it's of course something that we are considering, and I'm referring to um, minor, well, it's different type of crisis, of course, but it's crisis in, in, anyway. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm um, of course, um, um, referring to the, the, the consequence and the impact of Brexit on, of Brexit, sorry, on uh, a collaboration in terms of research and, uh, and um, mobility of, of students. Um, it is especially at stake at the moment when uh, we have the French presidency of the uh, Council of Europe, and uh, for instance, one of uh, well, one one specific uh, scheme, which is the alliances of European universities, which has been launched by France and Germany in 2018. Uh, this is still a priority at the moment to build the European academic uh, area, but today in this context of Brexit the future of these consortia of universities is questioned in terms of the sustainability of the partnership of British universities. And this is one of the topic we are working on together with our colleagues uh, from France and, and the UK, the universities which are together in these consortia are quite concerned by the future of the, uh, of the um, uh, presence of the uh, British universities. Also, uh, we are very much concerned by keeping our bilateral and European research collaboration. And uh, we are 
really uh, uh, concern, uh, especially because there is a strong will, still a strong will in the uh, British uh, academic community to work, to maintain their European status and to go on working together with European partners. Um, of course, this is um, very much at stake at the moment with when the UK has left Europe uh, Erasmus Plus program and also when the status of associated member of the uh, for the UK in Horizon Europe is uncertain and uh, more recently we have seen that the European Commission uh, has uh, questioned the uh, ERC the British ERC um, ERC being the uh, European Research Council uh, to choose a place, an eligible place in Europe where they can uh, continue their research work. So all these, um, all these um, questions at the moment are very much at at at, at stake, and. Um, it's for us, it's important to see that the British universities still claim that they are truly European universities. And on the European side, there is a campaign which is called, for instance, the campaign Stick to Science, which advocates for keeping the UK and Switzerland in Horizon Europe. So at the moment, we can stay reasonably optimistic, but we should prepare for collaboration with the UK out of the previous frame of the European academic and research area. So crisis can be of different type. And of course, science diplomacy is, is a concept which can help maintaining the, uh, well, we, 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 we have this kind of soft power, which can, of course, helps the connection between the uh, scientific community to, to, remain, uh, to, to, to remain lively and uh, which can help in the future when the crisis will when we will overcome the different types of crisis to maintain the cooperation and the uh, good will between the countries with that i think i will i will stop thank you very much mina and thank you to all of our panel for their amazing contributions the the wealth of of contribution has been really really important i think for this this topic and the variety of angles that you've taken so I think I, and I'm sure the rest of the, the participants will be really, really grateful to you. I want to start off by asking you a question. Um, it seems to me that what people are saying is that knowledge diplomacy, however we achieve it, is very much dependent on the structures that exist. And if those structures change, which inevitably they do, does it mean that we have to start again every time? Or is there anything lasting that we can rely on? Is it something that can last or is it temporary all the time? I don't know if one of you would like to come in on that. Jeremy, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I, I... I would say that it's something that you have to 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 build again each time. Um, at libraries for our borders, we try to have a very specific approach according to each context, and of course, each context is different. Uh, not only depending on cultural realities, but also depending on the on the relationships of power and uh, the the reality of the people just living into the crisis so no I, I i would say that for for and because each time the partners are different and the stakeholders on where they they, they come from and where they talk from uh, are different i think we we just have to redo each time uh the uh, the work of uh, ownership appropriation transmission uh when 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 we launched the ideas box in 2014 we were saying we are going to implement 1,000 ideas box by 2020. And now we have 150. OK, there is a question of funding, of course. But there is also a question of uh, uh, making customized term as your approach, which is, uh, you know, it's this kind of thing is not standardizable. Uh, so. Uh, so it takes time and if you want to make quality and if you don't want to make like a, a, a unique solution that you you know you bring all over the world uh you need to yeah each time 
we do we work with local partners local stakeholders and uh, start from zero i would say for from for for for, for each context when we arrived in Rungas refugee camps, for example, there was no local content in Rungas. So we had to work with the local communities to rebuild content because you know, when there is a genocide, they also attack the language and, uh, and most of things had disappeared. So yeah, I, I would say like uh, each time is a new, a new adventure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I, I'm not sure I go as far as to say it depends on existing structure. Is that there certainly has to be some structures to it, and these can be developed. Obviously, the institutional diplomacy itself is probably a precondition so that countries actually want to have um, beneficial context. In Europe, I think the development of the European higher education area certainly contributed to the kind of cooperation that also encompasses knowledge diplomacy. I think. It's even difficult to imagine European higher education today without what how it would have developed had we not started developing the European higher education area um, as of 1998, 1999, there about. Uh, but I think another part of the uh, question is what John pointed to, namely, what leeway do civil society actors have in relation to their public authorities? And I think that's probably an even more important question is that I think we can go very far in uh, maintaining cooperation, even when <clears throat> conditions are difficult, even when um, the academic community even when civil society do not have a lot of leeway. But there is a point <clears throat> after which, or at which this becomes very um, difficult. To take an obvious example, few people would actually advocate knowledge diplomacy with North Korea simply because there is no such thing as civil society in North Korea. Now, that's an extreme example. Um, and had it been easy to find the cutoff point, we brought, uh, you know, life would have been easier, but possibly also less interesting. So this is an ongoing discussion. Thank you. Thank you. John, do you want to come in? You're on mute, John. Yes, sorry. Um, yeah, I think I, I agree uh, that there's these limits really to what can be done <laughs> is what I guess I could say, depending on the circumstance. You know, I think when we talk about societies that have semblances of civil, civil society, you know, and the things that we think of um, as, you know, a, a society that's open to change in some form, um, then there's room uh, to do many things. And we're seeing many things uh, going on. But when you come to these, and I love the North Korea uh, example, I try to think in the book, I was saying, well, you know, we could have had many more examples <laughs> of illiberal democracies or autocratic regimes, you know, from uh, at the border, maybe the Philippines, but North, North Korea was a great example. <laughs> but who can write about North Korea? <laughs> you can't even get somebody to give you any knowledge about what's going on there. So uh, uh, I think even in, you know, we have to understand there are certain limits to this. And also, you know, I, I always think when I say, see this word knowledge diplomacy, to me, it's not a benign word. You know, it's not totally altruistic. It's, there are politics involved. That's what I'm kind of interested in, the politics of, of policymaking and these kinds of things. And there's self-interest involved. I just want to throw that out uh, because it isn't always just all about good. It's also, there are larger things happening. <laughs> Diplomacy itself uh, uh, connotates interests of some sort, I think. But uh, so maybe that's not quite the right word. But the other thing I want to say is, despite all of that, there's still significant infrastructure that's been built up over time uh, that on things that I think are uh, generally good for, for the world and society. And Europe has really taken a major uh, lead in much of this, the Horizon program, uh, but also the extension of which uh, to, uh, you know, South America, the global South, uh, um, the Europeans are much more engaged than the United States is. I mean, we, we have our star institutions and they have relations, Berkeley's and the, you know, Harvard's, they have relationships, absolutely, but not in this larger kind of strategic framework. But there is a lot of infrastructure there. The question is, how does one navigate, uh, navigate it if you are a faculty person from Ukraine or, or whatever. 
And then one other real, real quick comment I want to say is that um, Ukraine is an example, a hopeful example of we can have capacity building after some period we hope of stability in the region. And there is a lot being done going on. I know uh, Zelensky just re two days ago had a meeting with a bunch of AAU, American Association of University, uh, which is you know a big lobbying organization in the United States for higher ed with top institutions. He had an interview with them. And you know the, the concept was that uh, because of COVID, for example, a lot of lessons had been learned and there was an infrastructure uh, that exists for online education, so it's there. But it's, we hope we can build it back. Maybe there needs to be something eventually with the, with the help of the EU and others uh, of almost like a GI bill of some sort, because I imagine if the conflict ends, we're gonna have a lot of instability related to the economy there. And one of the strategies that was used in the US, for example, the GI Bill was to bring more people back into higher ed, to retrain them, uh, to take people out of the labor market, uh, these kinds of things. So, um, uh, sorry, long answer, but I do think there's a lot of very interesting infrastructure. It's just hard to navigate it and, and compute it. Thank you, thank you. Mina, do you want to come in on this one? Well, I'm not sure I'm straight, I go straight to the point, but uh, I'm rather confident that the, well, as a scientist myself, I think that uh, cooperation among scientists is really without border. And as it has been said, the uh, higher education and research area, which has been built by having all these students and researchers traveling at least uh, around Europe, but also internationally, has changed a lot the type of of ways people are working together. I mean, you don't need to be in a specific place. You can work together uh, at, from different places in the world. And I think that this is extremely helpful in time of difficulties where people can still rely on their colleagues, even abroad. And, uh, maintain this intellectual exchanges and when things come back to normal this allow them to work together again in presence so i, I think that at least again for the the, the 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 researchers it's a way to maintain when even if they are themselves in a difficult situation to know that they can have exchange of documents of hell, even intellectual exchanges is important in when when you are uh, isolated or, or or as long as you can keep connected uh, in a way or in another. Uh, I think these kind of intellectual and uh, and uh, um, knowledge really um, uh, exchange maintains the possibility of a future, even though the situation is difficult at a given moment. So um, I think there is a kind of sustainability there. Thank you, thank you. That cheers me up somewhat, but thank you very much. Um, I want to come back to John to ask you something, but before I do, can I just say to the panelists, uh, to the uh, participants, please do post your any questions you may have, and we can try and um, at least get answers to some of them. John, can I come back to you? Because one of the things you said was that um, knowledge diplomacy in itself is not, I think you were saying, not neutral. And I, I've been wondering about this because we tend to, to use it as, as if it is in itself intrinsically neutral. And I wondered if you'd say something about that. Well, I, <laughs> diplomacy connotes, you know, some interest of some sort uh, at play. And I, I don't mean that there aren't actions that are being done by the West, for example, to support Ukraine, let's just limit it to higher education or academics uh, in a, uh, that are fleeing. I mean, I, I don't know what the numbers are because most males are staying to, to fight. So I don't know how I feel for this completely or what the numbers are. Um, but in doing so, it relates to a larger you know, strategic concept of supporting uh, uh, what we see as a democratically friendly uh, potential partner in the EU. So that fits within a larger political realm. So I, I don't mean to overstress that there aren't good intentions or good things, but you know, it, overall, it, it always relates in some form to some political interest of some, of some sort. You know, when you look at the Fulbright program, which was maybe one of the real pioneers of, uh, of looking at uh, 
how to build relationships with adversaries, um, the concept was, you know, it, it had an altruistic aspect to it. We're going to bring people in to the United States and we're going to support people to go to the uh, other parts to learn more about what? Not, you know, the United States necessarily. Well, that actually part of it is that, but more or less to learn more about our adversaries. And uh, that was one of the major conceptual ideas of the Fulbright program. Uh, and then th this led to uh, area study programs, which became really the infrastructure of language programs in the United States in universities that you know, learn, learn Chinese, learn Mandarin, learn Russian. So, you know, that had a political dynamic to it, absolutely. So that's, that's all I'm trying to note. It's good to kind of think about it a little bit as we talk about all these programs and things that people are doing. Thank you. And Sian, I was going to come to you. Do you want to jump in at this point, Sian? Yes, please. I, no, I, I absolutely agree with John that uh, knowledge diplomacy is, is, is not neutral. And in fact, it's generally seen as something that's beneficial, um, which in very many contexts this is. I think we need to think through whether in some contexts there is actually knowledge uh, that we may not want to transmit to. Uh, certain countries, and again, North Korea would be an obvious example. But it's it's also very challenging now since knowledge diplomacy is a very broad term. Look at an area like history, research into history and um, teaching history. Um, as a council of Europe, we developed uh, a term uh, as a multi-perspectivity originally in um, our history education program, but it that applies to other contexts also. In history, multi-perspectivity essentially means that my history is not only mine, it's also yours. And your view, um, my history can be very different from mine. Uh, my heroes can be your villains, etc. There is a very important core to that in saying that you could look at the same issues from different angles. And uh, it is important that we do it. It does not mean that um, anything goes, that are all views are equally important. And in fact, one of the big challenges is distinguishing between understanding a phenomenon and accepting that phenomenon as legitimate. It's important that we understand how the Holocaust came about. If we don't understand that, we can't prevent it in similar occurrences in the future. That, of course, does not mean that we can accept the Holocaust as legitimate. We just have to understand how it's, um, it's developed. And we see also in, in many post-conflict societies that looking at each other's history is very challenging. We've seen that in Southeast Europe, but I mean, uh, look at my home, home country, Norway. Uh, Norway and Sweden, so they have very good relations. Uh, the Nordic uh, countries in general have very good relations. Now, it was only in the 1980s that Norwegian and Swedish historians were able to sit down together and discuss what we refer to as the dissolution of the union between the two countries in 1905 with any degree of dispassion. So, you know, if, if two generally friendly, uh, very cooperative neighboring countries um, took 75 years or something to do that, I'm not saying that they need equally a long time for others, but it does illustrate that um, we need to put a lot of effort into this kind of conversation. In this case, it was just between the two countries. It may be beneficial to broaden the circle and um, in, include uh, more neutral countries also in, uh, in, in the discussion like that. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Mina, do you want to come in? Well, if the point is, uh, is it neutral or is it political? It's clear that it's not neutral. And of course, uh, although uh, we all have positive uh, uh, ways of presenting our, our actions, there is also always a, a balance between collaboration, competition, and it's this balance will fluctuate also according to the political background of each of our countries and the national situation. Um, we, we have had recently a, a series of discussions about the impact on higher education and uh, uh, research uh, of the uh, interaction, the, 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 the changes, the new geopolitics of, connection, of co collaboration between countries. One of these uh, series was about uh, China uh, um, uh, United States 
uh, connections, interactions, and how it impacts the, uh, uh, the, the collaboration, the mobility of students, etc. And the second was about European changes, including the situation in, in Ukraine and also the Brexit. And uh, of course, this has a lot of impacts, I mean, in terms of um, uh, the uh, changes of alliances among, among the countries, uh, how people, well, if we talk about uh, UK, how they will maybe uh, go to uh, Australian, Australia, Canada, rather than European countries. Um, of course, China is a major player, and uh, they have now connections in Africa and other countries where uh, France, for instance, was uh, had a, a, a very strong um, uh, connections in the past and now it's changing so of course the evolution of the uh, alliances and the flows of of, uh, of students of, of collaboration is maybe more than ever uh, changing and we have to be extremely not careful but we have to follow these uh, these changes in order to anticipate or or maybe to keep uh, the, the the connections uh, the strategic the strategic connections that we wish to 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 have in the future and and as um, science diplomats this is a very interesting question and it's not simple of course thank you um john has put in the in the chat a list of collaborators for academics in exile at New College in New York City, in order to give a sense of the complexity of academics in exile initiatives. So that's there for colleagues to, to, to and participants to look at. And then, Sir, you put your hand up. Did you want to come in at this point? Sorry, no, that was a mistake, so I had to get down again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Jeremy, I don't know if you want to add anything to, to the discussion about whether knowledge diplomacy is neutral or value-laden. I think we have this debate internally for for the past 15 years, so it is not neutral. Uh, you know, I, each each time we ask ourselves the question, uh, we we get back to, to 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 the final objective of our work, and what we believe in is not like uh, is is to 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 train people to be able to, to curate themselves the information or the knowledge, to be able to make their own path into the information that uh, is available. So this is the final objective. But of course, in terms of crisis, or in terms of uh, when, you, when you work with vulnerable populations, with uh, low literacy, for example, or low digital literacy, of course, uh, when you make choices on the way you curate the information or knowledge you, you, you give them access to, of course, it's never neutral. But when you come back to what a library is, a library is never neutral. A library is a choice. It's made by, uh, it's always choices made by librarians. Uh, so so one, one thing we try to do is uh, try to always work with the field, with the actors on the field to, um, to avoid to make this choice from like a French perspective, for example, or from an ethnocentric perspective. Uh, and one thing, when we started Libraries for Borders, a big part of our work was to try to avoid to do only book donations because it was like very trendy in the, uh, in the years 2000 to, you know, give away lots of old books from our universities or from our li public libraries to, to Africa, for example. And that was causing like lots of problems. Not only, you know, the books were not adapted, but also in terms of competition for local publishers, for example. Uh, and one thing we, we decided from the beginning was to say, uh, we, are, we will never impose any books. So we work on putting all the books into a catalog, like a library or like a you know, marketplace, and people can do their own shopping on the marketplace and add the books to the cart. Uh, and this work because it gives agencies to people. And I think this is uh, the thing which is very important when it comes to, uh, to this question of uh, neutrality or this question of uh, how do you, how do you, yeah, it's about how do you give people the choice and, the, the, and you train them or you give them the tools to make their own choices. I can give you one example that struck me because we, we, we are, uh, often ask about censorships uh, uh, in our programs. 
And most of the time, there is no real censorship because we work with local actors that has already, you know, incorporated in their daily work this question of uh, local uh, censorship rights. And for example, uh, but when, when, uh, once it happens very, 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 very strongly, we have some programs in Kurdistan and inside the, uh, in Iraqi and Kurdistan, and inside the ideas box, there is uh, some uh, uh, crowd uh, social mapping tools. Uh, maybe you, you know OpenStreetMap, which is the open source version of uh, Google Maps. So uh, at, the, at that occasion, I learned uh, something very interesting. When you, when you are in, on Google Maps, it's not exactly the same Google Maps that you are going to see if you are in China or in Pakistan or in, uh, in the US or wherever. Uh, because they, you know, they, they change a little bit the maps according to each country discourse. But of course, an open street map is not the same thing because it's like a, a crowdsourced, uh, you know, map. So when we arrived with open street map in Kurdistan, they started using it, and uh, it appears that Kurdistan was not uh, written on the map. Uh, there was Iraq, there was Jordan, there was like Lebanon and Syria, but there was not, uh, there was not Kurdistan. So like people on the field said, okay, we cannot use that. So they asked us to uh, uninstall from, uh, fr from the server all the OpenStreetMap instances that were inside. So this is a, a, an interesting example of, um, you know, a very, for, for us, a very tiny point, you know, but that's of so much importance for, for people on the field. So uh, it's always this kind of thing. And it's of course never neutral. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, all of you. We haven't got any questions in the chat. So I think what we've done or what you've done is give everyone so much to think about that they're going to take that away. And it is so much food for thought. I think the richness of the discussion has been enormous. I'm personally enormously grateful. I think that I will take it away myself and think about what what the role of knowledge diplomacy in crisis is and it's all too relevant at the moment and that it, that issue of how long lasting it can be how 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 far we can build on it but we have to do something and i think that's the important thing and i think you've all given us some thoughts about how we can do something and the contributions of each of us in our different roles and our different positions can be enormous thanks to the panel Thank you to Jeremy Lachal, to Sir Began, to John Douglas, and to Mina Pham. Huge thank you to all of you. And you've certainly, for me, given me thoughts to take away for some considerable time. I want also to thank the organizing committee. That's Lilia Alieva, Tim Gore, Kim Lemin, Stuart MacDonald, and Simon Rove, who are responsible for organizing not only today's event, but the whole series. So thank you to them, and particular thank you to Lilia, who is, um, is, is, has been facilitating this whole event. Um, there is a question in the panel, uh, in, the, in the chat. Somebody's not seeing the list of collaborators. So John, um, can we make that available? Yeah, you know, I see way? you have, a, I can't seem to paste it in. <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the thing, I'm not quite sure why, uh, but I could send up send it to uh, over yeah. as an email, yeah. perhaps. We can do that. It's, just, it's entertaining because it's a lot of groups with right. a sense Brilliant. of the range. Yeah, well, we can we can make sure that happens. Sorry about that, Karen, uh, Karen, and thank you to everybody. I think we've come to the end uh, now, so I wish everybody a good afternoon and uh, good evening, and thank you all very very much.